Welcome to the um, online live edition of Tiny Melt Build Series. Uh, this is the, the April edition. That's a new series. So this is the place where Tiny ML technology and Tiny ML innovations meal, meet um, Tiny ML products. And uh, at uh, this series, you're going to meet uh, people who do build uh, things with Tiny ML. So it's not just so much about uh, uh, models, uh, but it's how, how do you how do you put all the things together, software, hardware, algorithms, models, all, all the tools to make good and useful applications with enabled by TinyML. So that's all this series is about. And today we are very happy and very fortunate to have a special guest. Uh, it's uh, Stuart Pfeffer. He is a co-founder of Reality AI. Reality AI is one of the um, pioneers in, in the tiny email space. They started um, um, a, about almost like 10 years ago. And last year, Reality AI was acquired by Renaissance um, Electronics. And uh, that's where Stuart leads um, the team are focusing on uh, ML and integration uh, with um, into in products. And that's what he's going to be sharing today. So next slide, please. Before we start, uh, it is my pleasure to acknowledge uh, our uh, strategic partners and sponsors. It's um, AZIP Technologies, Analog Devices, Adrena, Arm, Compass Marketing, Edge Impulse, Greenwave Technologies, Gravity Inc., IBM, ImageMob, Inotera, Microsoft, Nota.ai, NXP, OctoML, Polin Technology, Kixo, Qualcomm, Renaissance, that's where uh, Stewart is now. Schneider Electric, SenseML, Sony, Silicon Labs, ST Microelectronics, Synaptic, Sintian, and TDK in Vincennes. A uh, little bit of uh, housekeeping. So as you know, uh, tiny email communities are growing really, really fast. So we are over 14,000 people in 47 countries, in, um, in, in 47 groups in almost like 40 countries all over the world. Uh, so you can join those groups, uh, quite a bit of different activities there. Um, they do in-person meetups, they do online events, so, so you can join one near you. And uh, also we are quite active in, in the social media, for example, in, um, in um, LinkedIn, uh, also quite big community, a lot, of, a lot of information and resources there. So you're, you're encouraged to join. Uh, next page is our uh, um, uh, YouTube channel. So this this uh, presentation and this discussion today will be available on YouTube uh, this week. So you, you don't need to, to, to do anything. Just uh, go there. It's uh, YouTube slash TinyML. It also has close to 10,000 subscribers and quite a few uh, videos. And they keep um, coming um, as, as we produce. And um, th this will be available there as well. Another exciting announcement in two months, uh, there will be um, Tiny ML Europe, Middle East, and Africa Innovation Forum. This will be an in person event. It will take place in Amsterdam. Uh, registration is open, the program is open. Just go to the website, check it out, and, and, and register if interested. So it's going to be a very interesting program there, and uh, looking forward to this event. And this uh, Point. It is my uh, pleasure to introduce the host uh, for this um, build series. Uh, Venkat Rangan, he's joining us from San Diego. He is a maker uh, by his heart, and uh, he is a very experienced uh, engineer and a builder um, uh, in different fields. He, he is very uh, uh, diverse and very well-rounded. He has a lot of experience in the hardware, basic design, building boards, uh, building applications, doing coding. So, so he's a great person to, to lead uh, this uh, series and we are very fortunate to, to, to have him here. So he used to be my uh, colleague in Qualcomm for many years and I had a pleasure working with him here. And after that, um, he left and he started uh, his own company, uh, Dynamo Vision. Uh, and uh, he, he is a co-inventor and again, he's a builder and uh, Thank you, Venkat, uh, for, for driving this, and the stage is yours. 
Thank you. Can uh, <clears throat> welcome everybody. Um, happy to uh, host the series. Uh, this is the second of the series, and uh, Stuart has uh, uh, kindly uh, given his time. Um, with a little bit of background about Stuart. Um, he's uh, the co-founder of Reality AI, and uh, after it was acquired last year, like Evgeny said, he uh, continues to um, run the business. Um, Stuart holds a PhD from UC Berkeley and a BA from the University of Chicago. Um, so Stuart has a bit of a background from the finance side. Uh, it's uh, coming into the tiny ML space. We were just talking about that. Um, so welcome. Uh, Stuart, uh, and thank you for taking the time. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great. And uh, while Stuart uh, brings up some introductory slides, uh, just a bit about the format. Um, we are setting this up as a discussion. So uh, to folks online, please feel free to uh, put your questions on the chat and I'll go through that and uh, try to bring those in as uh, during the conversation. This is not a presentation in the conventional sense. It's more of a discussion. So I'd like to make it as interactive as possible. So uh, Stuart, um, uh, we were just talking about your background and uh, the acquisition last year. Uh, so you want to tell us a little bit about your, your where you come from and uh, just a little bit about the, the company. Yeah, and sure, happy to do it. Why don't I uh, just put up a slide or two about Reality AI just to explain, you know, for those people on here who don't know who we are and what we do. Uh, I know that this is not going to be a walkthrough of a slide deck, so I'll just do this, uh, just two quick slides, and then we can well, we can talk about the origins and move on from there. Sounds good. Okay, cool. So let me just share and... Hopefully you are seeing this presentation now. Yes. Yeah, so um, you know, Reality AI is one of a number of uh, offerings in the market today focused on um, generating models for tiny ML. That's really the space we live in, is in sort of an auto ML. And uh, our angle is that we are very, very heavily based on signal processing math. In fact, um, at the core of what Reality AI does is really an automated, algorithmically driven feature discovery and feature optimization that we do prior to generating uh, any kind of uh, a machine learning solution. So our stuff works very well on signal kinds of inputs and not particularly well on other kinds of inputs. This is really for non-visual, non-verbal sensing. That's where, that, that's where we live. So computer vision, not our bag. Uh, natural language recognition, not our bag, but figuring out whether this air conditioner is humming like one that's about to break, very much our bag. Um, our core product is Reality AI Tools software. And again, another key difference, yeah, we have the auto ML modules that, and uh, the Edge AI tiny ML export stuff that you would expect, but we also do a couple of other things that maybe you would not expect. A uh, big part of our draw is our modules for bill of materials optimization. These are where we try and take all of the information we can get from the machine learning build to help us find uh, the best combination of sensors uh, and sensor channels, the best mounting locations, optimize sample rate, bit depth, um, measurement tolerance, and basically generate specs that you, your procurement team can use to acquire components through the supply chain. Um, we also have modules for supporting the collection of data and automatically assessing its readiness for use in uh, machine learning and a variety of explainab explainability visualizations that reduce 
model function to time and frequency descriptions. Uh, so you're not talking, we're not talking about just scatter plots of observations in the feature space here. But again, our signal processing basis means ultimately most everything the models do can be projected onto a time frequency plane and visualized. And uh, that can very much help an engineer draw a connection between their uh, machine learning model and the underlying physics. So that's, uh, that's reality AI. Right. So you used a couple of terms there. So I'd like to dig into it a little bit. But yeah, sure. That, uh, so you mentioned uh, you don't, uh, the sweet spot is not vision, not natural language processing, but really yeah. dealing with sensors. So I'm presuming it's things like accelerometer, gyros. Uh, yep, current, voltage, RF, um, uh, squiggly lines, basically. Yeah. So is the common factor uh, that all of these have time series? Is that the common factor? What, what is the common thing? Yeah, I, you could, great question. I think the common, I, I would describe the common factor as this. Um, you know, we are at our core, an algorithm for selecting and optimizing features and then generating machine learning models on top of them. We have built this around an algorithm for selecting and optimizing signal processing features. So we are best fit for problems that are amenable to treatment through signal processing, where the kind of data is such that you might think, oh, maybe I don't need a data scientist, maybe I need a signal processing engineer to work with this, right? Sound is a lot more than just a time series of pressure readings. It's a physical wave. And the mathematics that describe the behavior of those waves is just a little different. And that's really what we've built the product around. Now, in the future, we can add new versions of this uh, you know, feature selection algorithm to look at other kinds of features. The principles are quite general. And you, know, you may be seeing some of that very soon, uh, expansions into other types of modalities. But today, we are really all about non-visual processing. OK, uh, that clarifies things. Uh, so and uh, you mentioned, uh, because it's not video and not uh, too much of the natural language stuff, it would seem that these algorithms are not, how do you say, they don't need these giant models. So they should fit yeah. right into the tiny ML space because of that's that. That's correct. And you know, it's funny because you know, when we first built Reality AI at the very beginning, we did not think of ourselves as a tiny ML company. We had a cloud API, we supported mobile and uh, 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 PC deployments and Linux and all kinds of things. Um, what we really thought of ourselves as is a tool for engineers and product developers to more intelligently and more efficiently apply signal processing. And um, what we discovered as we started to build our startup business was that pretty much all of our wins, you know, every time a cus when the, the customers we were actually winning were the ones that were going to deploy us on something really, really small. Because, uh, you know, a byproduct, a really nice byproduct of our approach, again, beginning as it does in signal processing and putting so much of the weight on features is that features are algebra and they are quick and easy to evaluate computationally. Um, they don't require anywhere near as much processing as deep neural networks, for example. And um, uh, we can, uh, it freed us up to pick the lightest, so much work is being done by the features that we're free to pick the lightest weight learner is just a very top layer. Um, very often we don't need even a neural network at all, let alone a deep one, a simple SVM can make the distinction if the features are good enough. So um, the byproduct of this approach was that the models that were coming out are tremendously small. I mean, much tinier than was available at the time. And even since the advent of um, you know, TensorFlow Lite and the like, in many cases, we can beat TensorFlow Lite by an order or two or of magnitude in terms of co computational requirements and uh, not have to resort to any kinds of 
accuracy, compromising, compression, pruning, or quantization methods. It's all just inherently small. Now, we're not a good fit for every problem, of course. You know, I, I listed a few problems that we're not good fits for, and there are certainly a lot of others. But when we're a fit for the problem, we're an exceptionally good fit. Okay, that makes sense. So um, you mentioned that uh, pretty much, uh, am I to interpret this as that you provide a tool to enable engineers to select the right features, and you provide some feedback saying, hey, this, say, a Fourier transform or a filter of some kind, you, you're able to evaluate all those in some kind of fashion and give a metric saying this is better than that? Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, basically, what uh, happens in Reality AI Tool software is that you load up a set of training data, you know, let's take a simple classification kind of problem where everything is fully labeled. So we have, uh, you know, we can do a fully supervised, uh, do fully supervised learning on the data set. We have an algorithm that will take a look at this data and mathematically knowing nothing other than we have a bunch of examples of A over here and a bunch of examples of B over here. And uh, we don't know what the anything about the some similarities or differences between them before starting, how can we construct a mathematical description of the similarities and differences between these two data sets so that, you know, in a sense, pick a feature space that maximizes the separation of those classes in that feature okay. space. And that's, that's in effect what uh, what Reality AI Tools is doing. Um, those feature spaces start off very, you know, our algorithm starts off very simple. You know, the, what's the simplest feature space? Raw data points. So, you know, um, many deep learning approaches would just begin with that, just take in the raw data and let the those all those lower levels of that model figure out what the features are. Mm -hmm. um, we do that not using deep learning, but separately in the, in the exploration process. Uh, we start with basic uh, just data points, statistics on those data points. We move into frequency-based features, basically all of the various permutations on the FFT. Uh, we can then move into time and frequency combinations, wavelets, time frequency coding, and continue to you know, statistics on uh, FFT metrics and continue to escalate until we get to the full capabilities of sparse coding, compressive sensing. In essence, we algorithmically throw the entire PhD level signal processing textbook at the problem and report back to the user. Here is a list of three, six, a dozen um, examples with varying degrees of computational complexity and accuracy that uh, we believe can solve the problem. And then it's an engineering choice, uh, a product design choice for the user to decide, do I want to use this model here that's slightly less accurate, but much less computationally intensive? Or is it worth um, upgrading my chip to something that has more RAM so that I can capture some extra accuracy? It's a design consideration at that point. Okay, right? that's, that's quite interesting. So, um, do you, does the tool actually create new features or does it have a library of stuff, library of PhD thesis in some sense that it can draw from? Yeah, so, you know, it, we certainly have libraries of feature families um, and, uh, but the user isn't, isn't hand selecting them, right? The algorithm is running through the full list and making recommendations. But then even within a feature family, you know, we'll, it'll try many, many different versions. So even with an FFT, we have flexibility in terms of the parameters of that FFT. How many bins do we have? How wide are those bins? Um, are we going to use the real part? Are we going to use the full part of the FFT? Are we going to take the, do a power spectrum or the log of the power spectrum? There's lots and lots yes. and lots of possibilities there, which will all be automatic. First, we select the feature family, and then we go and optimize the parameters of that feature until we have maximal separation between our training classes. All right, the idea here is to let the features do as much work as possible before we try to build machine learning because feature computations are computationally cheap and machine learning computations are generally computationally expensive, right? So in some sense, that is what, at least my understanding of deep learning, the initial layers are really computing the features. So yeah. you're saying, hey, don't, 
don't just drive it to data. We already have all these bright people who for hundreds of years have been doing this research. So just use that in some sense. Yeah, um, you know, if we have a chance, I'll post it in the comments, but there's a blog post that my colleague, Jeff, the mathematician who invented this stuff, right? Uh, the other co-founder uh, that Jeff, we it, it's it's on the Renaissance uh, website now, and I think it mistakenly carries my byline, but it's, uh, it's actually written by Jeff. And, uh, you know, he goes through and explains the mathematics of why, if the distinction is based on fundamentally you know, frequency-based discrimination, something that an FFT could tell you, um, a deep learning approximation of an FFT is provably much less computationally efficient by, what's it like uh, the cube or the something, you know, some, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's, it's a really substantial difference. So, uh, you know, that kind of philosophy is really what's behind what we do. You know, we don't, we didn't come to this as AI guys, right? We weren't algorithmic experts since we started an AI company, although Jeff was certainly an algorithmic expert when we did this. Um, our perspective was coming to this from the point of view of engineering and product design, all right? So, you know, the, the, the technology for this was originally built uh, prior to the founding of Reality AI over about 10, 12 years of contract R&D for U.S federal government customers in the military and intelligence community. And when we created Reality AI, we moved over everything that was not classified and not subject to export control and created a new company around it. But the point is, right, we were, all this stuff was built in the service of building stuff that has to work. And not from the point of view of how do we better use AI? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's not saying I have the AI, uh, hammer, I'm going to whack all the problems with the same thing, right? So yeah. uh, this is a, a pretty fascinating tool. So as now you're part of Renaissance, uh, is this tool chain available to all? Let's say I'm a developer, right? How do I get to use this thing? Yeah. So if you want to use Reality AI now, now that we're part of Renaissance, is you need to get it from Renaissance. Sure. So you need a relationship with Renaissance and uh, Renaissance's relationships tend to be with folks who buy a lot of chips. And um, so, you know, at the moment, most everything we are doing is still is, is now with um, you know, large customers of Renaissance. We will be uh, over time broadening this out through dis the distribution channels and make it available much more broadly in a new formulation. Um, you know, Reality AI as a startup was always focused on large enterprise customers. We never had a free, a free or a freemium version, right? And uh, that's continuing as part of Renaissance for now, but uh, there are certainly plans to open it up at, uh, in, the, in the future to um, middle and mass market. Okay. So uh, a question, um, maybe you can address this quickly, is the type of algorithm that you applied for your optimization? Oh, uh, for the for the feature optimization. I think so. I think. Yeah, yeah. So a feature optimization algorithm that is our secret sauce, and we don't really talk about how we do it. So uh, it's a it's a question. Unfortunately, I can't answer. But um, okay. yeah, sounds good. Uh, uh, so uh, Stuart and I we kind of brainstormed a little bit about what might be a good um, thing to pick up and kind of dig into. And one of those was uh, this thing called SWS, seeing with sound. Yeah. So if we take that as an example, um, let's dig into that a little bit and see how you designed the product, uh, what went into it, what were the challenges. So yeah, happy to, happy to uh, do that. And I do have some slides we can use to illustrate this. So just let me start by saying SWS, uh, it does stand for see with sound, and it's something we originally built uh, for the automotive market. Sorry, I'm going to share and I can't do two things. I can't talk and click at the same time, apparently. So give me one second here. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so, uh, you know, automotive SWS was something we built for the automotive sector. And the idea was, how can we make uh, the road safer using sound to hear things that other sensors can't see? Right. So collision avoidance uh, systems in cars uh, typically are based on cameras, LIDAR or radar. Right. Uh, excellent technologies that 
have been extremely successful in coll collision avoidance systems, moving on up into full self-driving. However, they are every single one of them limited to line of sight. They can't see what they can't see. So um, this was increasingly a problem for emergency vehicles that might still be a kilometer, a kilometer or a half away and approaching fast or are against a complex background that it's hard to pick it out. Um, cars coming around a blind intersection, you know, that type of thing. So our idea was if we were to put an array of microphones on the outside of a vehicle, not entirely dissimilar to what uh, a passive uh, sonar array might look like on a submarine, just a much smaller, much cheaper segment of such an array, right? Uh, we might be able to do it. So we uh, set it out. Originally, we thought of this as a demonstration of the kinds of things you can do with reality AI tools. Those of you who work in AI, who talk to people who don't work in AI, I'm sure know that very often they people have trouble imagining how they would make use of make use of it. So we wanted to give them a powerful example of something that everyone could understand what it's doing and um, you know figure out how it works. So uh, let's see here. Um, so, you know, what we wanted to do was be able to detect things that are noisy, like emergency vehicles, things that are less noisy and kind of blend in like cars. And then we were also hearing very from from the, the folks we were talking to about this opportunity that if we can figure out a way to hear quiet things like bicycles and joggers, that could also be very, very helpful. Um, we want to be able to not just say that there's something nearby. That's not really that doesn't help us much. We want to tell the driver where to look to see it coming. So, you know, angle of arrival and correcting those at that angle of arrival for refraction around corners and reflections off of other surfaces uh, and the like. So this is, uh, you know, this is what we were, uh, this is what we were trying to do. And you know, as we think about all of the different pieces that have to come together to make this work, yeah, there's some algorithms here. These detection algorithms are probably going to be machine learning. These localization algorithms might not be. Angle of arrival is certainly solvable without machine learning. It's, there's lots of classical signal processing algorithms for that, mm -hmm. um, and so on. Um, plus, we had a pretty significant hardware challenge to sort through. You know what? We, we want to do this, we're going to do this with sound, so we need microphones, but what are the requirements for those microphones are going to be? How many do we need? Where do we place them? How do we shield them from the wind so that this thing is a prayer of working when the vehicle is in motion? Um, how do we integrate this? Uh, eventually, it's going to have to be an automotive grade components and cabling. And then finally, uh, the, the firmware chain outside of the machine learning piece, the audio processing chain, because to get from that MEMS microphone to the machine learning model, there's a lot of processing that happens. That whole signal chain, um, we see customers kind of neglecting to pay attention to that at their peril frequently. So uh, what we wanted to do was get all of these things working together and in tandem and show how, basically show how it's done, right? So, um, you know, as we did this, these, these are the two things I wanted to talk about here in terms of, well, you know, what we, what we learned is that number one, you know, when you're dealing with these instrumentation type challenges, the machine learning piece and the instrumentation piece are very tightly connected. They've got to be, they've got to iterate together. You, you know, in a machine problem, you move an accelerometer a centimeter to the right or left, your data is completely different. You may need a completely different model. But, you know, similar with uh, dealing with these uh, challenges on the car, we weren't sure at the beginning to what degree the model performance was going to be dependent on the instrumentation and whether we would need different models for different mic locations. So that was one. Uh, the second thing we learned is that really where the work was in making this happen was not in the machine learning piece. You know, we have a good auto ML tool like Reality AI or any of the others that are out there. Constructing the machine learning model is, uh, you know, I wanna say the easiest part, that's not quite the right word, but it's the most straightforward part. The parts that there that you need really need the help with is in the hardware engineering, the data collection, and then all of the, the signal chain engineering to, to get you there. That, that's, where, that's where most of the effort actually was. Um, and so, you know, when we started off this, we were looking at that, you know, the classic 
uh, ML process model. If you go look at Google and you look at their blogs on how to do machine learning, this is what they'll tell you. This is the process. You source and prepare your data, you code your model, you train it, you deploy it, and then you monitor it and manage it, right? And we look at this and we said, wait, hold on a second. Just what, source and prepare your data? That's it? Just one, one step? That's all we need? I mean, that is two thirds of the effort and expense of the product, of the project. So, um, you know, it's it's really much more, in reality, it's got to be more iterative than that. Certainly for sensor-based projects. Yes, you source and prepare your data, you code your model, you train it, and then you look at your instrumentation and say, where is this working? Where is this not working? What else should I try? And then go back and try again and keep on iterating it, okay? So, uh, so if you, sorry. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe uh, why don't you switch to your next slide and uh, yeah yeah I was going to say so this is what this so what that meant in this case hmm. is you know we basically planned for three major iterations a first iteration that would be about basic feasibility simple equipment easy conditions let's just if we can't make it work here it'll never work anywhere so why bother um, then move it on up to automotive grade components and more complex conditions. And then finally, number three, which is really where we are now, prove that we are product ready. Uh, integrated system, automotive grade components, moving vehicles, testing in the real world. And uh, just, I, I was trying to get permission to show this video today, but we are now in a field trial with an autonomous trucking company. And uh, I had some video from the test we just did yesterday, but uh, it's, uh, I did. I don't have permission to use it yet, so I okay. can't show it. That's unfortunate. <laughs> yeah, it would have been fun but it's, to see yeah. It. So this this is this is how you know this is this is how that iteration kind of looks in real life. Okay, so this looks like a a, a good way to develop products, right? Which is start with something ideal conditions in the lab, make sure it works there, then slowly add more of the real world. Um, in in this case, I'm guessing that. You probably picked some certain kinds of microphones. How did you iterate on that? Uh, how did you figure out, say, your microphone was not good enough or the yeah. housing for the microphone matters? I mean, there's so many factors. Lots right? of things. No, abs absolutely right. So here's how we did it, right? We started off uh, for that first feasibility POC. Again, here, just we want to see is, is this effort even worth investing in? Right? We don't even know if this is going to be possible at all yet at this early stage. So we took a regular digital recorder, like the, the, basically this Zoom thing that has integrated microphones on it, not something you'd ever deploy in a product or on a car, but we just wanted to capture some sound and see if uh, the reality AI algorithms could like learn to find them at all. Not mm -hmm. worrying too much about accuracy, just you know, can we beat chance by a statistically significant amount? So uh, we took our digital recorder, we went out on the streets of New York City, and we parked a block away from an emergency room, and we recorded a lot of emergency vehicles going by on city streets. Um, we went out into a park and recorded a variety of cars and bicycles uh, going by our microphone stand, and we just kept on, we repeated them over and over again at different speeds and distances and tried to get as many reps as we could and then ran it through the algorithm to see how it worked. And, uh, you know, at this point, there's nothing about this design that's product ready. In fact, we would expect that 0% of this hardware won't finds its way into a product. We're not even putting it on an MCU at this point. We're running it on our servers because the whole point at this point is just does is this is this even plausible right so yeah the uh, when we did the data collection this is uh, our setup in the park with the car and you can see the microphone array set up attached to a digital recorder and you know we drive these things back and forth in front of our microphones a bunch of times at a bunch of distances the orange cones uh, that you see out there are all mark known angles so we're recording video as well as audio so that we can uh, um, do the angle of arrival portion of the computation and find a way to validate it. And uh, yeah, we dro drove it back and forth a few times. You can see this is a slight hill. That's by design because we wanted to get the car going uphill as well as downhill and um, you know get different sounds out of the same, different normal sounds out of the same vehicle kind of thing. But it's a quiet neighborhood. There's nothing around there but a couple of horses, right? We're not dealing with background noise is a major challenge yet. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to see, can we tell the difference between car and not car? 
bicycle and not bicycle. Okay. And uh, if you think back in retrospect, how much effort was, how much time and effort was it to do this part of the project versus the other two parts where you add more? Yeah, uh, uh, this, this, this part product. here was about six months all in. And bulk of that time was in the logistics of the data collection. So, you know, figuring out testing the hardware and then um, getting uh, getting out into finding a place where we could do the data collection, securing the ability to use the space, doing a few trial runs, figuring out what equipment we were missing, going back, doing it again, and uh, continuing to, to run these trials. Then once we had them, we had to get the stuff back in and label it. We had a bunch of interns who spent the better part of a summer um, you know, marking the key points on the videos where the car would cross known angles so that we could interpolate the angle of arrival for every point in the sound field, for example. So, you know, there was a fair, that, that, that's where, that's where the, the bulk of the labor was. Once we had everything labeled, running it through the machine learning to get the feasibility validation statistics out, that was a couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, I think that's a, that's an important learning, right? Because, uh, yeah. it's, uh, and that ties back to what your initial statements were about how much time and effort it is for the ML portion versus the data collection. Yeah, um, it's a, um, it's a, uh, it, it's, it's really where you're going to spend the time is in collecting that data and taking the time to collect well-structured training and validation data ultimately gets you to the finish line faster even though it takes a long time, right? Because the one thing you don't want to do is collect all this data, get it back in the lab and realize that you don't have enough data to actually solve the problem, right? Or the wrong kind of data. So how did you close that loop? How did you make that loop tighter so that, yeah. uh, say I'm, I'm one of these people right there on the road collecting the data and go back, were there simple tools or simple processes that other people, the audience, members can use, for example, that. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. And some of the tools that we created for ourselves here are now in Reality AI tools under that uh, uh, data readiness module. So basically, uh, every uh, we'd spend a couple of days on site collecting this data that would then go back to the uh, labelers and then into the machine learning and we would iterate on these things. So, um, you know, if we had a problem, we could get back out there and fix it right away. Or if we discovered that for some reason, the model that had been working on one on, on a previous iteration is failing on the next one, we could ask ourselves, is this just a question of we're not, we don't have sufficient data to generalize yet, or is there something fundamentally different about the data on those two days? And we discovered things like, you know, hey, there's a lawnmower in the distance and we're getting a wrong answer on some of these trial runs, but it might be that it wasn't actually wrong. It was hearing a motor that was over there somewhere, right? So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's it, getting it, working with that, don't wait to the end to actually look at and use your data. You wanna be able to work with it all the way through uh, the process because the most expensive way to collect data is to have to throw it away and redo it, right? Okay. And so once you did this, uh, there were, uh, if I think about how, Tesla deals with their problems, right? They have this whole real world simulation. Mm. Uh, did you, what role did simulation play in all of this? Did you go out and create, because the amount of data you can collect with this is limited, right? Yeah, it is, and, uh, and it's expensive, so yeah. yeah. We definitely had the idea of using simulation to supplement this data and put in a fair amount of effort into it. We uh, acquired simulation modules from uh, the video game sector along with their high fidelity audio modeling plugins. And um, we made progress, but ultimately the simulation environments were just not quite, we couldn't quite get real world out of them. And we had to uh, we had to back off of that. So we're 
the most of the simulation we're doing now is more of a data augmentation. Right. You know, we had built the simulated city streets and we could put virtual vehicles and, uh, you know, model reflections and refractions around corners and all of that. But that was ultimately not successful. We may give it another try one of these days. But what does work, however, is we take a clean recordings like this. We go out to another street and record background noise and we could superimpose background noise on clean signal and thereby generate a variety of training uh training and validation sets that did closely resemble real world. So the limit is the is the failure there in the simulation because it was you were effectively using certain uh, algorithms to create that sound scene in some sense and you were reverse engineering that through your algorithms. Yeah. So it That's what we were trying like, to do. Yeah. But uh, you know the so the, the the these models use a lot of approximations so as to you know the, the simulation models uh, so as to limit their their own computational needs. After all, the thing's got to run on a workstation and you know not dim the lights when it does so. So it's um, some of the approximations they were making were perfectly good for a video game environment, but we had to work around them. And uh, okay. it just became the point where we we decided that it was at least for the moment just a still a bridge too far. We'll, we will return to it because we do continue to believe simulated data is very promising. We just didn't we don't quite yet have the simulation tools we need to be happy with it ourselves. Okay. And uh, what's the current state of this? Is it is that uh, you mentioned you are in trials? Is yeah, how, yeah, how yeah. Yeah, we will see this thing. So. Now? Um, you know, th so that was the first POC. We did another one um, last year where we moved up to automotive grade components. Uh, we are now partnering with Molex. Molex makes microphones that are used in active noise canceling applications on cars on the road today. And we are now working with uh, Molex to design an array specifically for SWS. And, uh, you know, we did another set of conditions. Now we're actually out on roads. We're using automotive grade components and uh, made that work. And what we are, uh, we were able to now show, okay, here's, here's a level of accuracy that's achievable in real world conditions. Um, you know, we can hear emergency vehicles a kilometer to a kilometer, a half away with very high reliability. Um, we can hear cars, we can hear bicycles and the like. And this is where we are now. We're, we're now proving that it's product ready. We're mounting it on different locations. We have, uh, we're moving it, uh, we're implementing on the MCU and getting it out on the road. And uh, this is the uh, thing that's now in trial with an autonomous trucking company. And we're about to start one or two others as well. Okay. That's the current status. And anything looking back uh, at this project that um, as a developer that I should think about when I start a new project, for example, what, what were some of the major learnings for this? Yeah, well, like I said, I, you know, I think the two main learnings for me are number one, understand that you are going to need to iterate your instrumentation and iterate it in tandem with your machine learning all the same proof steps that you want to go through on one, go through on the other and do them simultaneously. Keep the hardware engineering and the machine learning development close, right? That, that's learning number one. And then learning number two is just understand that the all your real cost is gonna be in data collection and hardware engineering, uh, plus the validation steps to ensure that your product is actually ready to deploy. I mean, you know, basically this whole POC is about taking something that fundamentally works and now just making sure that it works everywhere at a standard where it can be relied upon in all of the circumstances that our customers would want to rely upon it. And that also is a lengthy exercise that has, you know, the, the machine learning development component of that's relatively small where you know we may tweak models to deal with edge cases and uh, different different levels of background noise and different geometries but that's not the you know the heavy duty ml lifting is kind of done right mm -hmm. but okay. there's still because a lot of, of work feature, to do because of the feature engineering yeah okay uh, yeah. i'd like to 
Uh, just pause a little bit, uh, request the audience to put your questions out if any. Uh, there is one question. Um, actually two questions that perhaps are relevant. Um, can you talk about something like distance between the features your approach discovers and the features discovered by lower levels of a DNN trained on the same data? Hmm. It would be interesting to know for which types of problems the DNN discovers an approximation of your feature space versus something altogether different. Yeah, you know, it's a really interesting question. I don't know that I have an answer to it. Um, I don't think we've ever done that kind of direct comparison. You know, I could speculate about what the differences would be. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the features that our algorithms discover are sort of closed form algebraic solutions that uh, with of formulas that you would find in the signal processing textbook. Right. And of course, the um, uh, the the features discovered by lower levels of a DNN, they're just going to be they're not going to be in that form, of course. Um, again, I think this is probably probably a good one. Uh, Jeff does talk a little bit about this in the um, uh, FFTs and stupid deep learning tricks blog article. And uh, I probably refer you to that for some of the underlying mathematics. But I don't know that we've ever done the specific comparison you're asking about. It would be interesting to know. Um, probably a good academic paper for someone. OK. Yeah. Uh, perhaps uh, Stuart, I'd request you to put a link to that in the slides. That way, uh, people can go look at those uh, blogs. Sure. It would be great. Uh, I think this is. Uh, very similar to what people are finding in the visual cortex, where they see these oriented uh, feature maps. Um, but you, I think the point is that it would take a lot, lot of work for a DNN to find a computationally efficient feature extractor that, like an FFT. And the, why, why throw a bunch of data at a neural network and try to help it find an FFT when you already know it. So you're short yes. to see that and focus on the higher levels where really you can make a difference. So the other uh, uh, question is, uh, can you explain the hardware firmware software architecture? Um, not sure what that is asking for, but uh, Perhaps you could cover how the uh, Real AI tool chain kind of splits things up. Yeah. So bring it all together. Maybe that's the goal of the question. Yeah, I guess I'm trying to figure out if uh, this is about SWS specifically or a different question. I think I'm going to answer it as if it's SWS. And I apologize, I don't have that slide in in my deck um, but basically the hardware architecture is, uses a set of an array of molex microphones connected using uh, an, a cabling standard from analog devices called a to b it's an uh, becoming a de facto standard for automotive audio cabling and it does require a little bit of electronics but um, worth it and um, so uh, we use a Molex microphone with integrated A to B interfaces, and uh, those connect to a master node, which is at our uh, ECU where the processor is. Uh, we're running a Renesas RH processor, and uh, that's where all of the machine learning uh, occurs. Um, there are a variety of models, not just one. So we have separate detection models for each of the types of targets we are looking for and a classification model to help us resolve um, conflicts between the independent detectors. We also have models for whether or not the uh, target appears to be um, approaching or receding. And we do both, a, we do the angle of arrival computation we do directly without machine learning. That's that's just signal processing software. But um, 
we do supplement that with some machine learning for things like detecting whether there are we're in the presence of refractions uh, or reflections that could change our outcome. Um, so that type of thing, and then that just feeds an output uh, an output block where we uh, uh, we put out a message saying every I think it's every quarter second what we've what we've seen and what we haven't. So is it, is the architecture something like there's sound coming in, then there's a whole bunch of um, algorithms running in parallel or in in some sense some things looking each one is looking for something specific and then you try to combine the outputs in something that is meaningful for everybody. Yeah, that's basically right. And uh, you know, we're trying to find a whole bunch of different things simultaneously, right? We want to know is there a target nearby that we should worry about? If there is a target nearby that we should worry about, um, is that what is the type of this target so we know what part of the spectrum we need to look at to do the angle of arrival computation? That's really the hard part of the angle of arrival, right? Like I said, there's signal processing algorithms for computing the angle of arrival. The hard part of it is figuring out which part of the spectrum on which to do those computations. So, um, you know, that is certainly informed by our feature selection. Um, but yes, all of these models will run uh, more or less in parallel. Um, maybe not exactly in parallel because of the processor architecture, but more or less in parallel and um, outputting their results. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, we use the each, so at each, we use eight microphones in total, four pairs, uh, one, basically one pair at each corner of the vehicle or each corner of the roof or each corner of the mounting apparatus. And we look at, um, computations for each mic pair separately and then combining them in between them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we had talked about another application. I think we're a little bit short on time. Um, just a very brief, like a minute overview, and then we can, we will have to close soon. Uh, you're asking me about the HVAC thing now? Yeah, yeah, that was. Oh yeah, yeah. That okay. So yeah, so we, we spent a fair amount of time talking about uh, this uh, um, uh, this SWS solution. The most recent one, which we've just announced as part of Renaissance, and again, the demo is available on our website, is basically for creating a self-diagnosing air conditioner. And I will go through this very quickly because we are short on time. Let me share. Where's my share button? Okay, I've lost my share button. Now, now I can't do it. And uh, okay. while Stuart's doing that, there is a poll <laughs> out there. So uh, do give us feedback. Uh, it really helps in dynamically changing the content of these uh, builds docs. I, uh, I apologize, but my Zoom seems to have lost its ability. Up oh, here it is. Found it. Just came back. Have you ever seen that before? The share button temporarily <laughs> disappears. That's never seen I that. Have. I have difficulty with that sometimes. Okay, here we go. So anyway, um, you know, I'll just say real. This is this is basically about creating a self-diagnosing uh, air conditioner. The idea is, by, again, by instrumenting it with a combination of uh, temperature and vibration sensors, we can detect a variety of conditions that otherwise would require an in-person uh, technician to be able to uh, to do. And like SWS, we've built out a full set of reference design. We've worked with a leading uh, HVAC testing and product development laboratory to help us with this. It's called uh, Optimized Thermal Systems or OTS in Maryland, their, our main office. And um, you know, we lay out all of the very all of the various components required to make this work. Now, you know, there are big differences between a commercial unit on a building roof or a window unit in a residence or a mini split system in Japan, but the framework can be applied to each of these. And um, you know, the, the models can be customized. Um, what can I show? You know, I wasn't going to go into the technical bits on this, but really talk about, again, the, the solution development process. Having learned from SWS, we, again, have a similar kind of process. 
we start with something lab based with only a few units hand wired with a lot of expensive components that we'd never use in production and then we move once we have it working at that feasibility stage we move it into field collection and then from there into a third phase where we've now got a real prototype that we can test and make sure it's ready for manufacturing and product use and so again you know we're reusing that same process now and the same underlying technology in a completely different sphere to develop okay. a product appropriate there. Thank you, Steve, uh, Stuart. Uh, yeah. This is quite fascinating thinking about machines telling us, hey, I'm failing. Um, any closing remarks? Any closing thoughts? Yeah, you know, like, like I said, you know, we come to this really from a different kind of point of view. What we're all about, and it's especially true now that we're part of Renaissance, right? We think about product development and engineering, not just the machine learning bit. And at Renaissance now, you know, Renaissance sells chips. And we didn't become part of Renaissance because Renaissance wanted to become a SaaS company, right? We got in, Renaissance acquired Reality AI because we can help them help their customers see ways of using their their core product more often and more effectively, right? And uh, what that also means though, is that when we are working with customers now, um, if the customer doesn't succeed in getting it through to a product, well, Renaissance hasn't gotten what they're after out of it. Right. So our interests are very closely aligned now, even more closely aligned than they were before, because if their customer doesn't succeed in getting this thing to production using this technology, well, we have we failed. Yeah. Right. And, you know, however many months we've collected a SAS fee is kind of irrelevant. You know, ultimately, we need them to succeed. Thank you very much, Stuart. This is I learned quite a bit. Hopefully the audience did too. Thank you very much for having me here. And uh, was is this the first M Tiny ML builds, or this is the, the second? Second one. The second one. Yeah. Yes. So uh, great. I'm very happy to be one of the uh, one of the first. So thank yes. you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to close. Uh, thank you for to the strategic partners uh, without which this would not have been possible. Um, AI Zip, Analog Devices, Arduino. Um, Compass Marketing, Edge Impulse, Green Waves Technology, Gravity, IBM, Imagimob, Inatera, Microsoft, Noto AI, NXP, OctoML, Polin Technology, Kixo, Qualcomm, Renaissance, Schneider Electric, SenseML, Sony, Silicon Labs, ST, Synaptic, Sentient, and TDK. Um, we have uh, executive strategic partners. Um, uh, Edge Impulse, the leading development platform for Edge ML. Uh, Qualcomm AI Research, advancing AI research to make efficient AI ubiquitous. Uh, Sentient, making Edge AI a reality. And uh, Platinum Strategic Partners. Uh, Renaissance, enabling the next generation of AI-powered solutions that will revolutionize every industry sector. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, Sony. The Gold Strategic Partners. Analog devices ahead of what's possible. Arduino. Um, And ARM um, AI, um, powering the tiny ML innovation. And Inner Terra, neuromorphic intelligent for the sensor edge. Microsoft. Sense ML, analytics to get suite. ST microelectronics. Synaptics. And Silver Strategic Partners, AI Zip, Compass Marketing, Greenwaves Technology, Gravity Inc., IBM, Imagimob, Nota AI, NXP, OctoML, Pauline Technology, Kixo, Schneider Electric, Silicon Labs, and TDK and Sense. Thank you very much for attending.
and uh, the recording will be available on YouTube soon.